So I'd like to invite Carrie to come up and, and join me um, as we talk about this and the idea of um, incarnation and vocation, which I thought was um, kind of such an interesting way they, in the introduction for this week. Um, it quotes Walter Brueggemann, um, who defines vocation as a purpose for being in the world that is related to the purposes of God. Man, that's a... It's heavy. It is. <laughs> um, that really spoke to me, though, um, because in my life, you know, it didn't take a straight journey there, um, as most of our lives don't, but um, my vocation is to um, work with grieving parents. Um, I work for an organization called Full Circle, and we offer um, bereavement support to different, um, to families, to children, um, but also to adults in different um, types of laws, going through different types of laws, and I um, manage a program for parents who are grieving the loss of a baby, um, an infant, or a, a pregnancy loss, a late pregnancy loss, a stillbirth, or a loss in the NICU, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I certainly, we're a secular organization, but I certainly feel God working through me in my work. Yeah. How did you, you get to that particular point? So what was, what was the, the kind of professional or vocational journey that got you there? Um, well, I, um, I did a lot of volunteer work. I think I grew up in a household that was helping. We, we, I had parents who were helpers, a doctor and a nurse, and so we were sort of taught to, you know, help. Um, and so I did volunteer work and um, married a lawyer. So I, you know, I, we, in law school, I, my work really was just volunteer work because we had to, someone had to pay the bill while he was in school. Um, but I realized as he got closer to graduation that my volunteer work was what meant the most to me, not the work I was doing um, to pay the bills. So I was lucky enough to be able to go to graduate school. I got a degree in social work. Um, I came to Virginia after that and got my license. And I worked um, in the hospital for about 12 years, or for 10 years. Um, and, you know, in various, I, I worked mostly with in the cancer patient setting, um, but really sort of was drawn to more end of life work and grief work. And so I found this organization um, that's, we're very small. Um, we offer all of our services for free. So we're, you know, always struggling um, to, to stay open and, and to keep the doors open. Um, and I started in the evenings running groups for them, different types of groups, suicide loss, um, just in you know, general loss, um, but really kind of was drawn to this group of parents who um, had gone through this devastating you know, loss of, of losing a pregnancy or an infant and sort of losing all of the hope and um, anticipation that comes wrapped up in losing a life so young like that. Um, so that's where I am. How does this this work feel different from kind of your previous work? Um, it's, it feels different because it stays with you, you know, all the time. Um, and you, you do have to kind of learn how to, um, how to move in and out of, um, you know, the, the really intense emotions that you experience, but it's incredibly rewarding. And for me, um, you know, there are so many things that I, you know, I, I don't have a gift for. I think I really, truly believe we each have gifts. Um, and um, Seth can tell you all the things that I'm not gifted in, like <laughs> say a checkbook or laundry. Um, but I feel like I have a gift for really sort of bearing, with, you know, sort of just bearing witness to people's grief and, and just being present with them, which is, I think, you know, the best that you can do for someone who's grieving. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it's, for me, very life-affirming, too. I mean, it, it is sad. It's certainly sad to 
to sit in that place and to listen to someone. Um, but it also, you know, is a, is a daily reminder of, of that every day is a gift and that, you know, nothing is really promised to us. So that, you know, it, it helps to put things in perspective. Yeah. And well, I didn't feel like that in my other life <laughs> in PR. Well, and that, um, you know, I think that that's a great kind of example of how sometimes uh, profession and vocation can be two very different things. Yes. You know, as a culture, we often think about them as being the same, yeah. but um, they may not be. And it may be that, you know, for some people that their job is, ne like their vocation is something entirely different yeah. and they don't overlap. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, how kind of fortunate to be able to yeah. combine the two. It is. But like you said, I think there's so many ways that you can find, you know, your true vocation, even if that's not what you do from nine to five. Yeah. You know? um, I think life gives us lots of different doorways to go through and find those opportunities. So. Yeah. How do you experience God or or Jesus in in the work you're doing and the people that you are, yeah. you know, in these rooms with? Um, you know, one of the core parts of our program is to bring people together for a group, a, a support group. And so, you know, we, they come together and I think the message that they hear over and over again is, um, you're not alone. And I think that's a really powerful message when you're grieving, um, because, um, especially in this kind of loss, it's, people don't understand always what you're going through and they have a hard time kind of relating to the grief that you're feeling. These parents don't have pictures, at least not many pictures. Um, they don't have a lot of memories, they don't have a lot of objects. And so the, their world around them finds it, I think, difficult to relate to the, what they're feeling and those intense emotions. So when they come into this room and they meet each other, they're just so generous and gentle with each other and they can come from all different walks of life but because they have this shared experience um, I really see God in the way they interact with each other and the way they kind of lift each other up and say I've been there and I know, and I know what that's like. Yeah, that's, that's got to be a really um, a very powerful thing it for is. them. They don't have to necessarily explain what they're going through. Right. It's a sort of a safe place. And I think when they come, we're, they're eight weeks long, which means that we can really kind of do some work and really kind of try and certainly don't make any major changes over those eight weeks. But we really have a goal of trying to sort of progress them to a point where they're sort of thinking, well, what does my, what does my future look like? And they might not be thinking that when they come in the door the yeah. first night. Um, and I think they kind of dread it, you know, that first night, as any of us would, because you're walking into something new and you're meeting new people and you're in this horrible place in your life. Um, but I think it, for most of them, becomes a very safe place that they know, like, you know, the rest of their week might be really crappy and they may have people say things to them that are insensitive or they may have people say nothing to them, which is also insensitive. Um, but they know when they get into that room that they're going to be able to sort of talk honestly with each other and openly and say whatever is on their heart. And so it's, um, yeah, I think it is a powerful thing. It's amazing. So shifting gears just a little bit, this idea of, of incarnation and experiencing God in, in the flesh. Mm -hmm. So you have three kids. Yeah. <laughs> How do you experience God in them? Oh gosh, um, it's really messy, and um, it's, you know, I saw a speaker recently, I think one thing I struggle with, I know that parents my age and, you know, all through life, I think my, my mom and dad are still struggling with this, um, where life feels so crazy and chaotic, and we sort of say, you know, tell each other or tell ourselves, you have to say no more, you have to practice saying no. But I saw this speaker recently and her whole message is to practice saying yes and kind of live in that chaos and find joy in that chaos. So I do, I mean, I, you know, I try and say yes. And I try and, you know, go into the kindergarten class and help out and, you know, 
try and, you know, there's lots of joy to be found in those types of places when you look for them, even if it feels like I have a million things I could be doing right now and, just, you know, I don't, this isn't where I want to be. So, um, you know, and there's lots of times when I don't feel like I'm seeing God in my children and, you know, I come here and that's one of the first things I always ask for on Sundays is for patience and for, you know, to be, um, to be able to, you know, live a little bit more, um, you know, with patience and with kindness. Um, but, but yeah, it's easy. I mean, it's easy to see. It's easy to see God in them um, because they're just so full of you know, questions and um, funny moments. So, but I find that being open to, you know, to the mess and to the chaos really helps me to, to I, I find myself that even though it feels overwhelming, I look at my calendar and, and it feels like I can't even, you know, get the time in to run for 30 minutes. It feels like, well, I'm going to, you know, if I look for it, I'm going to find some joy in those places. So just kind of be, be present to it instead yes. of trying to, trying to organize manage it all the time. It yes. all the time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that makes, yeah. makes a lot of sense. And um, I love the way you describe, you know, the, you know, asking for patience and, and looking for the joy, because you know, I think that that's maybe a, with, with kids, it's a much more acute representation, but like, you know, really that's how we interact with everyone, is that, you know, yeah. we need, need that patience, but to be open to the joy of right. relationship and encountering God um, right. in one another. Yeah, I mean, it, or, you know, it's easy to get overwhelmed easy to feel. I mean, we, you know, saw that with Caritas a couple of weeks ago, but if you look around at what was happening with, you know, with the way our parish was coming together, with the way these families were interacting, I mean, it was really something to be, um, to see God in, if you were yeah. looking. Great. Any other thoughts on your vocation? Or... Um, you know, I think just, I came to the Lenten Supper this week, and the message, you know, just about loving, you know, our neighbors, I um, mean, you know, sort of, I really thought about that video, and I really, I wanted to sort of come up with, because we talked about love last week, you know, I thought, well, what, if, you know, what does my life, what word, but I really think love is, you know, putting love out there is, is the most sort of important. Um, at least for me, that's that's sort of where my where I would like my life to. I, I can't say that I do that all. The time. <laughs> I can't say I just live this life of love all the time. But I think it's certainly my number one like aspiration. Yeah. And I think you know, as far as people um, who are in pain go, just you know, if you experience someone, if you come across someone, like that we talked about, lean into them. You know, be there for them. I think that's what people need when they're going through something. Yeah hard and, and it keeps showing up because that's important, you know, it's not just making one sort of outreach effort, but, you know, really trying over and over again to say to them, you're not going, you, you have to go through this alone, but I'll walk with you, yeah. you know, I'll, I'll be there and I'll, no matter how, you know, dark, you know, you need to be, I, I can, I can handle that, I can manage that. The, the ministry of presence is often the most powerful and healing yes. thing that we can can offer. I, yeah. you know, when I did my hospital chaplaincy internship, I went in thinking like, oh man, I'm, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to, like, I'm just gonna screw all of this up. And I very quickly discovered that just being there yes. was the most important thing that I could do. Yes. But that's... Yeah, I um, read as, I was thinking about this morning, um, I read Bruce's reflection in the Annunciation this week. And, um, you know, I think when people start talking about doubt or guilt or shame or anger, it's easy for us to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to let you, like, take that on, you know. I'll let you work through that over there. Work through that on your own. I don't know how to respond to that. And I think, again, just being willing to talk about it and not yeah. saying like, oh, don't feel that way. But, you know, I think saying, 
I'm sorry that you know you feel that way. Let's talk about it yeah. more. Um, can be a real gift to someone in a time of need. Absolutely. You know, to to talk through. If, you know, there's things that come up all the time that I don't have an answer for. I don't. I don't. You know, I don't know how to help someone. So I think meeting as a team, but also I learned, you know, when I was in school and um, I was did all my schooling in New York City, and so I always had a long commute that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't driving a, driving a car. I was, um, you know, on a bus or a train, and so I really learned um, to, you know, I already loved reading, but reading really helped sort of pull me out of um, of work. And um, so I think, you know, my reading, cooking, you know, finding things that you, that make you happy and make you feel sort of fulfilled is really important. My kids certainly pull me right out. Not always in a good way, but I, <laughs> as soon as I get home, I have to respond you to You can't them. dwell on it. Right. I have to immediately sort of shut one part off. So that, I mean, they're, they're certainly a help in that yeah. way. Um, but yeah, burnout is, is a problem um, in our profession for sure. I wonder where you see God in that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I think you see God in, in seeing um, another colleague suffering and, you, and feeling like, gosh, I'm not the only one who, who gets frustrated or angry sometimes at people. And, um, you know, I think... Um, you know, in the, one of the videos this week, he talked about how important the message this week is that Jesus was here and he did kind of go through what it's like, you know, to be live life as a human on earth. And so... God was present in the messiness and the chaos. Yeah, so. it's helpful to think about Jesus that way and think, you know, that he experienced, I'm sure, all the same angst that we all do um, and but yeah he's a role model for how to move through that well thank you carrie and thank all thank of you, you for being here um